Welcome to today's lecture. The purpose of this lecture is to put some context to John Winthrop's sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, so that you can better answer the questions on your worksheet. What is the background that allows us to understand John Winthrop? We should see him as a figure that stands at the very beginning of a long process whereby traditional European society begins to dissolve and is replaced with a social system we know as capitalism. In this process, Puritans played a starring role, at least according to Max Weber, whom we call Max Weber in German, a sociologist who attributed to Puritans a path-breaking contribution to making capitalism happen. On the other hand, if you read John Winthrop, that seems completely counterintuitive. Winthrop is preaching an ethos of altruism. In other words, you want to put yourself first and, uh, excuse me, you want to put others first and the root of all sin is selfishness, is a lack of regard for the needs of others and for the common good. Whereas, of course, in capitalism, self-interest is considered a virtue as the driving force of all positive change and good social order. So how do we get these two things together? Because, as it turns out, they're both true. To understand how Winthrop feels about economic life, we should look at the way this was set up in Europe at the time that he left. What I call the traditional European order, where the guiding principles of people in society, in religion, in the economy, in politics, was that everything, every rule has to follow from scripture. Everything has to be justified with being in accordance and pleasing to God. There is a sense of community that is a given. People don't think of themselves as individuals as much as they think of themselves in their social role, as a farmer, as a knight, as a craftsman, as a noble. These are places in society, a station in life, so to speak, that people are born into. In the same way they are born into a particular faith. Before the Protestant Reformation, that we discussed previously, there was rarely any occasion to question what, what kind of faith you follow. You follow the faith that everyone, everyone follows. For that reason, it is not problematic to have one religious justification for everything in society, for what is a good ruler, for what is fair in exchanging, producing and consuming goods of daily necessity, and so forth. And for that reason, it was the ideal of this traditional order that you have an entwining of political, religious, and economic power. So if the king is the head of the church, and he has the greatest land holdings in all the country, and as king, he is also the guy in charge of the state. He is the politically most powerful person in the country, that was not considered collusion or a conflict of interest, as you might say, but that was considered to be an ideal order. In our modern society, on the other hand, we consider religion, politics, and economics as three distinct spheres. Just because you have economic power doesn't necessarily mean you get to claim religious authority. Just because you are a well-regarded minister doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be filthy rich, and so forth. In fact, it is also a founding assumption of our social and political system that these three spheres, politics, religion, and economics, function by different principles. For instance, whereas in religion you want to think of God and your fellow man first, in economics, you want to be your own best friend and you want to put your own self-interest first. And politics kind of stands awkwardly in the middle, um, 
striving, the state, the political system, striving to do justice to all these different demands. So Winthrop, as the leader of this colony, has all that power that is proper for someone in charge in a traditional order. He works for the proprietors and he is a co-owner of the colony. The colony of Massachusetts Bay is a privately owned, technically for-profit enterprise chartered by the crown, by the King of England. Winthrop is also the head of the church, of the Puritan church, and that church is going to be the only game in town in New England. If you want to be in New England, you're going to belong to that church. So he's everybody's spiritual head, and he is one of the wealthiest people going into that colonial venture. And he is also going to be the governor of that colony. So he gets to enforce and make the laws. So for that reason, when he gives this sermon, it is not just any old Sunday sermon where you try to give your congregation something to ponder and to live by for this week. It is rather a longer term thing. It is foundational for this project of establishing a God-fearing and God-pleasing settlement to serve as a model for the whole world throughout all the ages in all eternity until Judgment Day, so to speak. So the subject Winthrop chooses for that sermon that is foundational for this enterprise is significant. Out of all the things he could have talked about, he chose to address the question of inequality, primarily economic inequality, but also the inequality of power. He wouldn't have done that if he would not have considered inequality to be a serious issue. Considering, as he does, that self-interest is the root of all sin and of all evil, if the economic order or the political order is set up in a way to encourage people to be selfish rather than to think of the common good, their fellow man and the glory of God first and foremost, then you can't set up a godly society, then you cannot do right by God. And for that reason, he has to provide a model. How are people supposed to interact with each other as economic individuals? It turns out that the ideals that he has in mind, the mutual respect between rich and poor, the obedience of the poor to the rich, the charity of the rich towards the poor, and the realization on all parts of this division of labor that no one can succeed unless everyone works together resembles closely the ethos of the craftsman's workshop in Europe. Craftsmen in a time when there was no industry, no industrial manufacturing and machinery, were the people who made everything that you couldn't do yourself. And of course, on the farm, people tended to make more things for themselves than in the city. On a, in a regular village, you might only have the blacksmith as a specialized craftsman who shoes the horses, um, who makes the occasional plowshare or possibly um, you know, nails and saws, saw blades and so forth. In the city, on the other hand, where you have a wealthy class of citizens, nobles, patricians, merchants, and the retainers of a court, possibly, you know, clergymen, bishops, etc. You have a demand for more refined products and the specialized crafts that produce these things from scratch. So if you want a fancy carriage to ride around in, somebody has to have the knowledge to build that thing from the raw materials on up. And if you want shoes and a gown to wear to church on Sunday and look sharp as a rich person in a city, you need to find craftsmen who can do that for you because you can't buy anything off the rack. There is no rack, you make things to order. So the crafts are the most important segment of the manufacturing part of the economy. Now, granted, most people at the time live in the countryside. Urbanization is a minor part of the population, but in terms of its economic importance, it has a far greater share. 
all that wealth from trade that we discussed when we looked at the bigger picture of world exploration, of course, accumulates for the most part in the, in the um, bank accounts of merchants who live in cities. So in these cities, the crafts are the backbone of the economy. Full citizens are more likely to be employed as a craftsman than anything else. And the way the crafts are organized is the ideal type of how people are supposed to interact with each other in this society. It is a very patriarchal affair, a craft workshop. You have a hierarchy in the occupation that is based on skill. The first level of craftsmen that comes into the workshop, usually at age 12 or 13, is called the apprentice. And the apprentice is taught everything that there is to know about the craft. After the apprenticeship that lasts five to seven years, you graduate to become a journeyman. A journeyman is so called because while he knows everything about the basics of the craft, for instance, if he's a cobbler, he can make a shoe from scratch. If he has a tanner that provides him with leather and soles, Nonetheless, before he becomes a master of the craft, which is the third and highest level of the hierarchy, he has to specialize and broaden his skill set. People, of course, were aware that in any given location, skills are bound to atrophy, to deteriorate over time. So the best way, if you want to build innovation into this system is to send people away and say, go out into the world and journey, hire with masters who know what they're doing, who are doing innovative stuff. Compare notes with the other journeymen, young men in their early 20s that are like you traveling through Europe. So journeymen were often, the apprentice who was finished and became a journeyman was usually told, get out of town and don't come back until after three years. And then, you know, show what you've learned and we might make you a master of the craft. And once you accomplish that, you may well end up with your own workshop and you can hire your own apprentices and journeymen. So once you become the master, you're the person in charge of the household as well as the workshop. Just as with the big picture, with Winthrop or the king, on the small level of that workshop, of the master of the craft. The same logic applies. Religious, political, economic power are supposed to come from the same source. It is a very patriarchal setup. The master is the owner of the household. And of course, household in Greek um, is the word oikos, and that is the word from which we derive our English term economy. So. The original economy was considered a household economy, and therefore the person in charge within that most simple unit of the economy uh, is going to be the father of the family if you assume that you have a patriarchal society. Under the roof of this workshop, above the store, so to speak, the master lives with his family and with all the servants as well as with all the employees. If, if you are an apprentice, in essence, your parents make a contract with the master of the craft who takes you in to make the master your legal guardian. You enter into a substitute father-like relationship. And it is not just the introduction to the craft, but also making you into a full human, including any broader and especially religious and moral education that might be part of that. The journeymen live under the master's roof as well, although they have a little more autonomy. They have their own organizations and their own rights, but ultimately the master is the, with the one in charge. In this household of the master, there is a great degree of equality and collegiality. For instance, the master does not simply 
tell people what to do and then walk away to let others do the work. It is a quintessential part of his self-understanding that he works in the workshop and then others watch him do it and he, um, he will teach them in that way. And occasionally he will tell a journeyman or even an apprentice, go do this thing on your own, try to make a shoe for this person, um, try to form this leather into the upper material of a shoe or what have you. And that is how you learn. But it's a collaborative effort. And it is, while, not, while people are not lazy, there is certainly a sense built into the work process that work is embedded into something larger. So usually one person in the workshop is going to be freed from work to provide for entertainment. Mostly that involves reading, and at this time it usually means reading from the Bible, although of course other works um, of religious writing and then later on, obviously this is the age where the print revolution takes place, um, other books of philosophy, discovery, or even of uh, you know, instruction in the trades would also join that reading material. 